if you think by belittling kids in front of the whole classroom is the correct way to teach kids, you know, you're really not fit to be a teacher. To develop that discipline from a very young age, there's no doubt that it helps you get through so many things later in life and you apply that discipline. I think it says everything about a father and a father figure where all you want to do is emulate your father. 2007, after my dad died, Arnold hosted it and he said, if it wasn't for Reg Park, I wouldn't be here today. Good morning there, John John Park. Uh, welcome to the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. Good morning, Gareth. Nice to see you after all this time. Yeah, I'm and, uh, good to see you enjoying the life in Brazil, beautiful Brazil. Yeah, no, thanks, man. Um, I've been so excited to speak to you as a guest. I think this has been years in the making, but <laughs> so um, we actually first met, I think it was 2012 in person. I Correct. came to LA and I, I trained at your gym, which was awesome. And like we went yeah. and we had lunch together afterwards, which was also super cool. And it was really nice for me to like put a face to the name because I feel like I had almost known you my whole life, you know, because you and my mom used to swim together. So she had always spoken about John John and about your dad. And I was like, yeah. this is super cool. You know, it's like meeting my mom's friends overseas. It was like a surreal experience, but a cool experience. Well, actually I have vivid memories because, um, your mom and I used to uh, train with a coach um, who said he's no longer with us by the name of Ronnie Borrell at the Wondrous Club. And in fact, we were, in, we were put in lanes and we were in the same lane. And I remember we used to do kicking, long periods of kicking, holding a board. And your mom and I would kick next to each other and have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I even remember clearly, it's funny how certain things come to your mind is... Uh, I used to struggle at school, uh, not because I didn't have the ability, but I was just so into my sports and truthfully, probably not a, a, a good message as a, uh, you know, in terms of being a role model to younger people, but I wasn't interested. I just said, I wasn't interested in academics. And I was remember talking to mom and telling her I was worried about getting my report card, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> you know, because I didn't think I'd done too well. And uh, it's just funny how certain things come to your mind from all those years ago. You know, we're talking over <laughs> 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy because actually now that you say that, um, Maybe that's exactly what you and my mom had in common because she obviously was a, a great sportswoman as well. And She's a um, great swimmer. Yeah. And uh yeah. and I remember her actually showing me her her report card. Um, you know, obviously yeah. obviously she had way after she had finished school. And I think it was history or something, and she had like I know something crazy. She was like, it was like 9% or something on her report card. And she was like, I didn't really like school to be totally honest with you. And I wasn't a huge fan of the nuns. So maybe that's why you guys had a, had a good chat then. <laughs> yeah, she was, she was at Rosebank Convent. I was at Parktown Boys. And I, and I actually, a uh, story, <laughs> I remember when, I think it actually in that very same year, I went, it was summertime, so school was closed, but I went, I got my report card. And I'd failed. That was then called standard eight, right? So I went to see the headmaster. And uh, of course, it was summer and, uh, you know, six weeks vacation and I had a little moustache. So he says, he said something, he was very stern, this guy, you know, and um, Mr. Cameron. And um, he said, sit down, Park, you're making the place look untidy. He says, moustache and all, you know. So... I asked him in those days, Gareth, we had an A stream and a B stream. That B stream were the guys who struggled a bit and some of the guys I know who are a little bit, you could say, on the wild side. I don't want to say bad side, but wild side. And some of them just weren't cut out academically and they left school standard eight. They had to finish standard eight and they became what we call Mackies mechanics or whatever, you know. <laughs> but they certainly had the ability in those fields. So I said, can you put me up B stream? He said to me, look, um, I want to ask you a question. He says, why don't you go to like Damlin, which was, you know, every, all my mates who struggled, you know, that end up at Damlin because they crammed it and crammed it in until you, they forced you to get through. So I don't really want to do that. He says to me, 
swimming wise i'd like you to stay he says otherwise you're wasting your time <laughs> <laughs> Oh, classic, bud. Um... <laughs> so anyway, he, he went on to say, um, you know, I've had a lot of complaints about from parents that you're sort of not a good influence on their on their on their sons. I went, whoa. And I went home, I told my dad, I was, you know, kind of upset. So of course my dad called him right away. And it was very interesting. He changed his whole tune. He says, because, I mean, I was like most young boys. I had fun and I was a little naughty, but I was, you know, to be frank, I was a leader, you know. So, um, you know, I'd do something and the other guys would kind of follow suit, but nothing bad, you know, uh, just typical boy stuff, mischievous stuff. So uh, my dad called him and he said, apparently he said, my son is a bad influence on uh, on some of the other boys. He says, oh, no, 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 no. That's not at all what I said. I meant to say, it didn't come across well, that, you know, your son has so much charisma that uh, the other boys kind of follow what he does. So he changed his tune entirely. <laughs> and my dad was, you know, besides being an iconic figure, which I realized more and more as I got older and certainly after he passed, but he was a very dynamic, forceful personality. So, you know, people would kind of, if, if, he, if he confronted you and he didn't do it in an aggressive manner, you'd sort of back down, you know, you just, that's just who he was. So anyway, it was an interesting experience, but it was interesting because in all the years at Parktown Boys, um, certainly in the individual races, I was undefeated. So, you know, uh, and then I um, I stayed down one year and then I actually went up and then I came to the States and I finished my high school in the States, my final year of high school, which is just as well, because uh, very strict curriculum we had in those days in South Africa, you know, based on the Commonwealth curriculum was way higher than the, than the US curriculum. And so I, I had a more easier time here in my final year but I also took easier subjects so I got through At the end of the day I got through and you know later on in life it doesn't matter it all equals out it, it does it does it and it's a uh, it's so true like often it's that uh, that naughty guy that actually has almost way more influence than he 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 realizes you know like it, it, it's just the way it is and um uh they're often like if you channel their energy correctly, they can be amazing leaders, or I guess they can kind of like really disrupt people and sort of take them yes, on yeah. the wrong path. Um, well, you're absolutely right. Because um, I mean, I look back and I just think that I remember when my dad used to do seminars years ago, he'd say the one subject that's missing from school is palate education, talking about nutrition. Uh, and yeah, in America, they had home economics, but it was different. They taught you how to cook, you know, big deal, but he was right. And I just think, I wish when I was a youngster, they had sports schools like they have today in certain countries. Uh, it's just a matter of channeling and finding out what you're interested in. I'll tell you something interesting is, uh, I had a friend, sadly, he's no longer with us, a close friend, Italian guy. Um, who, who, who sadly died in a plane crash, a guy by the name of Salvatore Di Bella. But uh, he never finished school and he became exceptionally successful later on in life in the tiling business and bathroom accessories. Very, very successful. To set up his family to an extent that'd be okay when he left. Then had another friend who um, he kind of lives all over the world. And in those days in high school, uh, also South African guy, uh, they would have these industrial psychologists coming to your um, school and they would meet with you. And they said to him, no, you probably end up being a farmer, you know. And he ended up to be multi, multi successful to the extent where he's got homes in several countries all over the world. He ran his own hedge fund. Uh, and interestingly enough, one of his homes is in uh, Stellenbosch and it's magnificent. 
and he had a farm there, <laughs> a vineyard. <laughs> so he, he never be. I guess you could say became a farmer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so it's a matter of finding the right niche. And in those days, it was just so, um, you know, uh, conformed, and it was structure. And I guess I didn't fit into that structure and that, you know, the conformity of how one had to learn. I think if they had other areas where, yes, I understand you have to do basic things like maths, of course, you know, um, <clears throat> but if they found other areas, I think I would have excelled. And frankly, uh, to an extent, and I have some friends who are doctors who I respect, or one of my longest, closest friends who I grew up with, Stephen Amwells, who your, your, your mom would know, also was a swimmer. Uh, he's a renowned doctor here in uh, Cincinnati. Him and his wife, they run a, Sandy, they run a clinic. And um, um, he said to me once when we were kids, he says, you know, John, John, you're not stupid. I said, really? He says, no, you're not stupid. I said, why do you say that? He says to me, because you know every single soccer player in the English first division. He says, <laughs> you know, so you've got to have something. But he said, it's just what you're interested in. And frankly, I'm saying that because in a sense, I don't regret, but I think uh, had I been challenged in the right way, I think I would have been very good as a sports medicine doctor, you know, because a lot of what I do today en encompasses rehab, um, helping people um, um, rehabilitate, prehab, preventing injuries, um, and even some massage and a lot of nutrition. So it's, you know, all encompassed. But, um, you know, it's you, you, um, you go along the path which you find comfortable. And, uh, you know, my whole thing is to try and um, never stop learning. You know, I'm, I'm very, very hungry for, for learning all the time. I spend a lot of time researching, researching all the time. You know, especially at night when I'm, uh, I don't sleep the best, but and maybe it's not the best time to do it because it stimulates you. But at night time is when I'm in alone time. That's when I do a lot of my research. Yeah. Look, I think I think school is, it's 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 not really designed properly. You know, in in many ways because you have yeah. whatever thirty kids in a classroom, like mm -hmm. one teacher, and um you know, like 30 different personalities, like almost 30 mm. different ways of learning, uh, you know, just like different backgrounds and different interests. Like how are you yeah. supposed to sort of manage and uh, get everyone through um, with that sort of setup? It's, it's really not possible. So I, I think schooling has a, needs to change a lot uh, because yeah. that's where, that's where certain kids get left behind, you know? And like you yeah. said, like, you you almost maybe got left behind because you didn't have that say teacher who who looked at things like that and they were like oh actually there's a lot of potential in this guy he's just like let's flip and put him in like give him another subject and he'll fly so yeah i think modern schooling has to change a lot and um and yeah, yeah. slowly it is i think which is which well, is because the, nice. the the world is changing of course in many ways bad but in other ways you know good yeah so yeah, you I have agree. to be more progressive, you know, and yeah, and if you didn't fit into the system, you were labeled right away. Yeah, you know, like oh, he needs extra maths, and he's like a, you know, he or he he needs to go take lower grade maths or whatever the story is. And I mean, yeah. cheap as how do you, you know, that's how you knock the confidence out of somebody. You know what I mean? So just to just to give you an example, um, and I guess these are all things that influence me greatly in terms of my my attitude towards school. Um, I went to like a, a preschool, uh, a kindergarten preschool, but they had like a grade one. And I was completely ambidextrous uh, as a young kid up until the age of 10. But the teacher, I was too young. I was like five in grade one, you know, first grade. The teacher forced me to write with my right hand. So even to this day, I hold a pen very awkwardly. I hold it with my thumb over. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I can't write with my left hand anymore, but I, I could. So that was one, you know, they just, and some of the teachers used to like hit you with the, with the ruler on your left hand. And then I'll never forget. So here I am at, um, you know, 60, um, 67 years of age. And in my third year of school, which would have been st uh, standard one, I had a teacher belittle me in front of the, the whole class. Um, and uh, what happened, she was trying to teach us how to spell the word apple, which of course is very simple, but to pronounce it in a phonetic manner. And there were like half a dozen of us and every time we did it, we uh, would screw it up. And of course, you know, kids can also be cruel. It should make us stand in front and the whole class would laugh at us. So she said, those of you with older siblings, please go and call your older siblings. So I had to call my sister Jeunesse. She was in standard five last year of elementary school. And she came out the classroom. And as she came out, I started to cry. She said, what's going on? And I told her, she says, go to the bathroom, wipe your eyes. I told them you went to the bathroom. Because my dad had instilled in me, he says, don't cry in front of other people, you know, keep it inside. Don't let them know you hurt. And I did. So I came back and of course screwed it up again. So she said, I want you to work on him. So when I first started the class, uh, they used to have parent teacher night. And uh, in the very beginning, one day she belittled me again before this incident. She said, Silky the fairy. And so I'd gone with my mom to see the Wizard of Oz. And I think it was the Wizard of Oz and there was Silky the Fairy. I said, she, because she was a young teacher, I said, she reminds me of Silky the Fairy. But I felt a little embarrassed. She said that in front of the whole class. So anyway, after this incident, uh, my mom was this very refined, classy woman, you know, very uh, sensitive, kind manner. Everybody loved her. All my friends loved her because she kind of used to love the stories after Saturday night out. And she liked the naughty boys. Naughty, but fun, you know, good naughty, if I can say that. Anyway, um, and she knew what was going on. So she went to the headmaster and demanded that I get moved. And uh, she went to see the teacher. So I just have you know that if this is your methodology of teaching, you have a lot to learn. If you think by belittling kids in front of the whole classroom is the correct way to teach kids, you know, you're really not fit to be a teacher. And she said, I will tell you this, John John did think he was a silky the fairy, but now he thinks she's a wicked witch. Years later, a uh, number of years ago, Michelle and I were in London and we stayed with a um, cousin of ours who's very close to my sister. They're around the same age. And we went for dinner one night and her brother um, came up uh, to spend uh, the weekend and he was living in Bristol. We went out for dinner and he was in my class in primary school and I had no idea. And he spoke about an experience that he had in standard one. It was the, he shared the exact same experience with me that you, I didn't remember, you know, him being involved in that, but he was. So it just shows, so here he is all these years later and he struggled in school too, to a large degree, the two of us. And he ended up to be a successful psychologist. So yes. you never know. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is like saying you never know, like, I mean, for that teacher, like it could have been almost that, which like made you disinterested in school. You know, it's like. In fact, it was that and one other experience I had. It yeah, was very much was it. You yeah. see, like those are like such huge defining moments. And I don't think, well, clearly she had no idea, but so many people that are in those sort of influential roles, they, I don't know if they just don't know how to do it properly or they don't realize their responsibility, but you have a huge yeah. responsibility, you know, like it can make or break a, a kid's kind of like career or, or school or schooling or, or whatever it is, future even. So yeah, bad. Um, it's uh, it, yeah, we're talking, well, we're, talking, we're talking just shy of 60 years ago, so that's how long you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know it's crazy. So, anyway, like talking yeah. about naughty though, right? Um, yeah. 
a kind of cool way to kind of like sort of go from here is like in, I don't know exactly know what year it was, but like many, many years ago, you were in Bloemfontein and it was a Transvaal school swimming tour, but it didn't really end up being like maybe how it should have ended up. And you guys ended up in the Sunday Times newspaper. Now I'm wondering if you remember this at all or do I need to jog your memory? No, actually, um, that wasn't me. No way. Uh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't involved in that. I know the incident you're talking about, but I, I wasn't involved in that actually. Ah, interesting. Because yeah. I, I asked my yeah. mom, I was like, yeah. "Hey, mom, give me a give me a cool story for uh, John John," <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she wrote this long thing. And it's but that's actually very interesting because this this is like shows um, our memories, right? Our mem- we, we think we yeah. remember things. And like the people yeah. and stuff involved, but actually our memories are are actually really bad, you know, in when it comes to many things. So I just think, you know, it's it's, it's an interesting thing just to almost like talk about then, you know, the fact that you actually weren't involved there, but my mom was like, yeah, no, he was definitely involved. <laughs> no, no, actually, well, I think she's associating me with with a guy that I was very, very friendly with at the time. And I'm happy to say we reconnected um a few years ago. Um He's a great guy. Um, he was a South African 100 and 200 meter backstroke champion. Uh, he was a naughty boy, <laughs> but a good guy. Uh, and he's, he's, he's ended up absolutely fine. He does um, ocean swimming now in a big way, and he lives on the coast. Ah, cool. Um, and his name's Michael Farrell. Okay. I should remember Michael Farrell very well. Yeah. And he was also one of the naughty boys, um, but he, um, he was a fin. Fantastic, talented swimmer, probably one of South Africa's most talented sw- uh, swimmers. We went to our first nationals together in Cape Town, senior nationals. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so yeah. cool. Like, I mean, swimming swimming is such a great sport, and like, I mean, I I just 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 listening to you, you know, speak now about like the relays and stuff like that. Like, I, I also swam, I'm not at your guys' level, but um, it, I just had so much fun swimming, you know, and just just that like now I almost feel excited. Just like I want to stand on the block there and wait for somebody to come. And then you just, it's just, it's such a cool sport. Like, even though it's individualistic, it's also very like, I don't know, like you, you feel like you're part of a team when you're doing it. It's like the, the support and well, it's great. You know, you, you, you form a camaraderie and a bond that never, ever disappears. Um, for example, I haven't seen or spoken to your mom in many, many years. But here we are, we have clear and vivid memories. Because what that sport requires, and all sports if you want to be successful, is a tremendous discipline. And to develop that discipline from a very young age, there's no doubt that it helps you get through so many things later in life and you apply that discipline uh, to whatever else you do in your life. I know that I certainly have, and my friends who I'm talking about have, uh, no doubt your mother has, um, because to to go through that, you can't just be a run-of-the-mill person, you know, um, and it helps you with making certain decisions. Listen, life is ups and downs, and we face with challenges, whether you like it or not, but you have to learn to deal with those challenges, and it's how you get through those challenges, and it Trust me, it may not be pretty for a long time, and it's not all, you know, uh, roses and rainbows life. It's just not. It's but but it's just how you get through it. You can just roll over and give up, or you can drive. And of course, I was very very fortunate to have a father who was at the pinnacle of being the best in the world. You know. So I know that I had that advantage in me because, in fact, when I was swimming um, competitively, when it was a big meet, uh, yes, the coaches prepared me. But in terms of mental preparation, I went to my dad before race because he'd been there. He'd been there and done it, you know. And I only found out later on in life that a lot of my friends, not in a, in a, in a negative way, and a lot of the, my, my uh, you know, um, associates um, were envious that I had that. Um, and again, a lot of the things that I took for granted when I was a kid, 
including the the um, iconic level that my dad was, you know, uh, looked at, um, I took for granted, but I'll never forget um, South African Nationals 1976 was in Durban. And I actually felt jinxed swimming in the old Rachel Finlayson swimming pool uh, in the 100 meters because I'd never won a race in the 100 meters. It was always second. But what happened uh, two years in a row at the end of, um, during the December summer vacations, there was an annual meet. It was always in Durban with Transvaal, our, our province, state versus Natal which was, you know, the coast. And um, both years, they never had electronic timekeeping in those days. And I don't care what anybody says, but I know that I touched first because I saw under the water the other guy touching just a snippet after me. But the, the manual stopwatches couldn't separate the times. But they gave the win to the other guy and uh, second to me twice. Um, but they gave us the exact same time. Now, I know if they would have had electronic timekeeping, I would have won it, maybe just fractionally. So I felt that I was jinxed. Anyway, um, on the Tuesday night was the 200 meter butterfly. And um, in the trials, uh, in, in the heat in the morning, I, um, I broke the South African record. So it came to the evening and um, I had the middle lane, but on one side of me, I had probably South Africa's finest swimmer, who, by the way, I'm in touch with, who lives in Australia by the name of Paul Blackbeard. And your mother would definitely know Paul, probably South Africa's most talented swimmer. We were great rivals in the butterfly. Uh, he was a hometown boy from Durban. He had a uh, South African colors in three events, swimming, um, ocean water swimming and surf life saving. Talented guy, great guy, also done very, very well in his life, lives a good life. He lives in um, in Perth, Australia, but he's lived all over the world. He still does ocean swims. He competes in master swimming and uh, has done very, very well. He holds some records. And um, we've become, we had a great respect for each other during our swimming days and we've become very good friends. Um, so he was on, the one the uh, one side of me and then there was a guy by the name of Roy Abramovitz who was a few years older than me who when I first started swimming I looked up to him and he had been in the States and he um, came to swim in the States on a scholarship and he came back to South Africa and uh, he decided to make a comeback he was from uh, Transvaal Johannesburg as well and I'll never forget um, so 200 is four length and on the third lap, when we came to the wall, Blackbeard was ahead of me, um, just at the wall, and Abramovitz was quite a bit ahead. He was already in his first lap. And something inside me said, I'm not gonna let these guys beat me. There's no ways. And I turned it on and I came out of the wall ahead of Blackbeard, and then I just turned on that. I, I held some back. It's interesting to think if I would have gone out a bit faster, what may have happened, but I held some back. The fourth lap, I just gave it a go and I touched the head of Black of Abramovitz and I broke the South African record again. So the next morning at the heats for the 100, the race I felt jinxed in. Um, my dad was massaging me. I said, how should I swim? He says, go and break the South African record. And I looked at him and says, no, I'm serious. So... I did. Then came the final. And I'll never forget, same thing. One on each side. I had the middle lane, lane five. And the two of them were walking around, psyching up. And I just sat. So I learned from my dad, focus. I just sat on my chair, just staring at the lane. I didn't get up. I didn't shake my arms loose. I just focused. And in my, in my mind, I was going through exactly what I was going to do. But I said to my dad before the final, how should I swim? He says, go and do whatever you like. And I look at him, I said, what? He says, I'm serious. He says, you won the race. He said, go and enjoy yourself. Do whatever you like. 
and I, I just went for it. He, he felt that mentally I had them already, you know, they were watching me, you know, and I did, I won the race and broke the record again. But I had that. Obviously, I trained hard, I had the ability, but it was because of my dad, you know. And then fast forward the same year, um, through my dad's birthright, I was able to get a British passport. And of course, during those days, because of the embargoes and apartheid, South Africa were banned from international competition. So um, I went to swim in the British trials. Now, we never had a decent indoor 50 or a decent heat 50 meter pool in those days. I'm talking about 76. So I did all my training at this horrible basement indoor pool called Hillbrow Baths. Uh, belonged to the Summit Club and you could smell the chlorine as you went down the stairs. It was only 20 yards. And I trained hard, but I lacked, my turns were very, very good, but I lacked that endurance. Um, I just missed qualifying for the 200 meters. Uh, so I was very disappointed. And before the 100 meters, I couldn't mentally prepare myself. I'd almost like, yeah, I did. I hadn't almost, I'd given up. So I spoke to my dad before the race and Gareth, I can only tell you, he laid into me and he said, all this work you've put in, you haven't done it for nothing. He says, forget about last night. He says, now you go there. He says, for your whole family and for you, go and show them what you have. And it was like, oh, this fire just lit up inside me. It just ignited me. And I qualified for the 100, you know. So, yeah, did I have that, some people would say, an unfair advantage, you know, of having a person like that behind me? If you want to call it that, uh, well, I was fortunate and I took the best out of it, which has given me the drive to continue to do what I'm doing to enable me to wake up you know, very early in the morning and get on with it, you know, no matter what happens. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Like that. Uh, I mean, just the, the mindset of a champion, you know, like he, he picked and choose different answers depending on yes. the situation you're in to kind of mm -hmm. raise your game. You know, that's like, mm -hmm. that's a true mm -hmm. champion, you know, and, and the fact mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, I think so much of sports and life definitely is, is actually really about your mindset. It's that is ultimately what 100%. separates, you know, the average people from the elite people. Like it's your mindset. Yeah. You know, if you can yeah. handle the pressure, um, handle difficult situations and, uh, you know, rise to the top and use your energy in the right way when you need to, then that's what separates the two. Like mindset is so key to everything that we do in life and um yeah. people don't give that enough attention i don't think yeah 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 so um you know but it's interesting how you end up in life and as you say you know and certainly in school curriculums things have to change um because you brought up a very relevant point is that you can't treat everybody the same you know, and people learn at different levels. Some people are sponges and they pick it up like this. You know, they don't even have to study hard for exams. Some people need it repeated twice, three times. I'm a person who has to go through something two, three times. Um, but I'm tactile. I learn more by touch, you know. Uh, when it gets too sort of scientific and that it loses me and I have a hard time with that. Um, but then I also try and figure things out from um, a pragmatic way and experimenting on myself and, f you know, finding out how the best way to stimulate a muscle is and what's harmful and what's not harmful, you know. So you have to tap into, um, to, you know, what a, pe a person's strengths and weaknesses are much like my dad tapped into me teachers should have the ability to do that and I remember a few teachers that I had that I really enjoyed being in their class it's funny you say that uh, 
you know, your mom, Caroline, uh, you know, didn't do well in history. That was probably one of the subjects that I really did well. And I remember having a teacher who I really enjoyed his class because it's the way they put it across. You know, I remember when my middle son, Travis, was at high school and I went to parent teacher open house and there were a couple of teachers there. And there was this Cuban guy who I thought was fantastic, you know, and I thought, wow, I wish I would have had some teachers like that when I was at school, you know. And he had a journalist teacher who was great. And uh, it's, you know, those are the mentors. That's where, those are the people who make an impression on your life where you, um, you know, that live with you forever, whether it's good or bad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, I think it might have been maths for my mom now that, now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. you're so right. Like, I mean, I can look at my own schooling career and there's like a couple of standout guys for sure that, uh, you know, that, that really became my mentors. And it's, it's funny you say that because actually, Sean Fuchs, his dad uh, ran gyms in Joburg as well at the same time as your dad. I, I, flip, I can't right. remember the name of his dad now, but his surname is Fox, right? And your dad and his dad were really good friends. Because I messaged him yesterday. I was like, hey, I'm speaking to John John. Um, I remember you saying that your dads were both good mates. Um, and he's like, yeah, no, they they were. They both owned gyms, like in, I think, in Joburg and Hillbrow. And, um, you know, they, they were just like very well known and um, trained together sometimes. And, yeah, so so that's funny. Like my mentor was actually good mates with your with your dad his dad was good mates with your dad which is pretty cool oh that's interesting yeah a lot of commonality there yeah. no absolutely but um so just yeah. talking about your dad like now that i'm a father uh, myself i sort of you know you start looking at life a little bit differently and you start of actually re realizing like the importance of a father figure you know i think yeah. in society now we're experiencing a lot of issues because there's a lack of fathers and you know, divorced families and just like single mothers and, you know, the, 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 the masculine energy um, and traits of having a father are so important for a kid's development. And um, I was wondering, like, you know, you, you speak so highly about your dad. What was he like um, as a dad for you? Well, um, I think it says everything about a father and a father figure where all you want to do is emulate your father. So if that was the case, which it certainly was in my case, that speaks volumes about our relationship. Um, and there were some, obviously most positives, maybe one negative, which I'll share with you. Um, and had had no fault of his. Um, but, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I took a lot of things for granted. But I had some wonderful, wonderful experiences. And many live with me. Um, every year, my dad would hold the Mr. South Africa uh, in January and this started because he hosted the Mr. South Africa at the Johannesburg City Hall because every year when he had his gym business um, he was very ahead of his time he got very big into the mail order business in terms of selling equipment and to this day I still get emails and uh WhatsApp texts about people having the old Reg Park barbell plates, which were throughout most of the gyms in South Africa during that time. I'm talking 60s, 70s. So he had the Reg Park, Reg Park barbell company and he equipped many, many gyms throughout South Africa. A number of them were really old pupils of his. So did gyms exist before he got there? Yes, of course. But I think he really put the gym business on the map in South Africa. So many former pupils opened up gyms. You know, most of them had Reg Park Barbell. So there was a Reg Park Barbell. Then he got into the supplements. Reg Park uh, supplements, protein powders, vitamins, etc. 
And then he got into um, gym bags, the Reg Park Health Studios bag and the clothing. I remember the t-shirts were all very cool. He had Reg's, Reg Park Health Studios V-neck t-shirts. And all the guys who I swam with wanted them, guys and girls, that they were cool to have different colors. And then later on, really cool. Uh, my mother came up with the, the idea because he had spent some time in the States training at Gold's Gym and World's Gym. She says, why don't you just do Reg's Gym? And he made these really cool fitting Reg, Reg's Gym tank tops that were rib material. And at the bottom on each side, it had instead of just straight across, had like a little V. So they were tapered. Everybody wanted the Reg's Gym tank tops. And actually, I've revived them with the guy that I, um, I collaborate with in Switzerland. The Reg Park um, clothing wear, cool sweat tops and uh, t-shirts, and we 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 have a drop shirt, tank tops, etc. So we've recreated that, which I'm about to sort of exploiting a little bit more. Um, so in order to promote his mail order business, every year he'd bring out the top bodybuilder, um, and they would tour the country, the whole of South Africa and do exhibitions throughout the whole country. And they would have a show in each state, like Cape Town, uh, Durban, uh, Port Elizabeth, you name it, they'd do shows. And we'd travel around in convoy and a number of my dad's staff would come with. And um, they would set up, um, you know, on the stage, like lifting stuff and just put it up, dismantle it. And um, one of them was a guy called Dougie Baggett, which, who was a Mr. South Africa, but he was also South African uh, judo champion and the Western world judo champion. So he had put on the display, and then he had high a, a stand-up comic and a band and very well-known stand-up comic in those days was a guy called Cy Sachs. And we would travel and we'd have a great, great fun to all these different coastal resorts. And they'd have the Mr. Western province, Mr. Natal, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the guys that came out were Americans because they were the top guys. And the winners of all the, the different competitions would then qualify for the Mr. South Africa, um, which was held in the city hall. And um, I remember watching my dad at six years of age and seeing the, you know, the applause that he was getting for when he did his posing routine, you know, it was very dramatic. Um, you know, he was the first bodybuilder in the world ever to pose to music, which came about because my mother was a professional ballerina and she used to go and watch him do exhibitions. She said, how come, you know, and I've, people who listen to this, I'm sorry to be boring, but you know, a lot of people don't know this, but he, uh, and for those who haven't seen before or know the story, but she said, how come when um, the guys do their posing routines, they don't use music? He said, I don't know, it's never been done before. So she says, well, I think you should start doing it. So they got, uh, they chose a classical piece of music. It was very dramatic called uh, The Legend of the Glass Mountain. And my mom choreographed his whole routine. So when the music was very deep, She'd have him on the floor when it was high and stand up and transition from pose to pose. And as is well known, not only for what he accomplished, but because of this, the legend of the glass mountain, he was known as the legend and became known as the legend. So first time he did this, I brought the house down. And now it's a mainstay in bodybuilding today. There's no bodybuilder that doesn't pose to music. They've taken it to a whole new level. Some of them are very ballet-like, ballet-like, and some of them are very artistic. And you know, I've seen some unbelievable posing routines of guys. I remember a guy called Vince Taylor who posed to music uh, that was from the Terminator, and was un and he moved like a robot. He ended up winning the Arnold Classic one year when I watched this. So I've seen some phenomenal routines. But my mom was the pioneer of that. My mom and dad. But I remember very vivid memories of him posing. And I just thought, I want to be like this one day. And then, of course, in the 60s, he was, um, you know, they, they got him to um, um, do the Hercules movies. They chose him because 
you know, he was the first, I would say there were some great physiques before him. I mean, the guys that he looked up to, the first one was the first Mr. Universe by the name of John Grimmick, who represented the US in, uh, in Olympic lifting. He was a very strong man and he was also a good gymnast and uh, he won the um, Mr. Universe in, um, in uh, 1949. And um, my dad had just finished his military service, and it was also the Commonwealth Games at the same time in, 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 in the UK, in London. And my dad came uh, out and he went to watch this first ever Mr. Universe. And there were two icons in bodybuilding still to this day. There was John Grimmick, who was the Mr. America, two-time Mr. America, which after that they wouldn't allow a guy who had won a Mr. America to compete again, which set precedent throughout the whole world. That's changed now. So if you won a Mr. Britain or Mr. America, you couldn't enter again. And the other guy was a conic figure um, who uh, ended up making Hercules movies. Uh, a very good looking guy with phenomenal symmetry by the name of Steve Reeves. So my dad went to watch and um, Grimmick had a very rugged physique, was very, very strong. But he ended off his routine by going down into a double splits. And um, he won it and Steve Reeves came second. And my dad sat in the audience and he said, I'm going to win that one day. And um, he started training. And um, he ended up winning the Mr. Britain. And in 1950, Grimmick had retired. He competed in the Mr. Europe, which he won. And the following night was the Mr. Universe, and it was Steve Reeves who came second to Grimmick in the Mr. America. And uh, Steve Reeves was Mr. America winner himself. And um, many people to this day thought my dad should have won it, but he was up young and upcoming. And this was Reeves's last ever competition, and he was already you know, looked up to as a very good looking man with a very aesthetic physique. But my dad was more muscular than him. There's a great picture of the two of them standing next to each other where my abs, dad's abs were prominent. And um, Reeves was a little bit softer. His peck line was a little bit softer. There was like a point difference, but Reeves won it. But it inspired my dad to come back, which he won the following year in 51. And then Reeves retired and he got into the Hercules movies. And then Reeves stopped making Hercules movies and got into making some Westerns. And um, they sought my dad out, the film crew from Italy, and asked him to come for a trial in uh, Cina Cheetah Cinema City in Rome to, to um, act as Hercules. And they wanted him to grow a beard. So we were actually in Cape Town on the beach and somebody arrived on the beach with a telegram from them inviting him to come to Rome um, to, um, you know, do this um, trial for, for, for Hercules. So he was very, very forthright and he said, yeah, providing you pay me first class, you know, you buy me a first class ticket and you pay for all my food and accommodation. So he got there, he did the test. They said, do you want to see it? He said, no, not really. I just want to go and work out. <laughs> so he did, of course, he got the role. He made five, four Hercules movies, one Samson movie. And we used to go, and I was very young at the time. And when I was like three, uh, we spent some time in Rome. You know, um, I guess that's where I acquired my taste for uh, Italian food, which has never waned and the, the language and uh and then i there was a period of time when italy had the best soccer football in the world and all the top players would end up there and i loved italian soccer and ended up having some great italian friends one who i spoke to you about earlier Sava di Bella, and just loved everything about the italian lifestyle i mean hey how can, how can you not like if you don't like italian food there's something wrong with you, <laughs> you know? and the fashion and i know there's a big italian influence in brazil as well um and even then you know 
I kind of going to remember going to film sets and I saw there's a iconic shot of him pulling a chain on the beach. Uh, it's Hercules, you know, he's pulling a boat in. And then um, I, I decided I wanted to be like that, you know, even as a little boy. I mean, in, later on in school, uh, on Saturdays, you know, a lot of my friends would go with their dads to work. Most of them being accountants or lawyers and go and do their work on Saturday or some of them own, you know, car dealerships. I would go to the gym. So that was my exposure. So we'd go to the gym and my dad would work out and I'd go with him on Sunday mornings too. And he'd put me on a pull down machine when he was doing pull downs to add extra weight or sitting on top of a standing calf machine when he was doing standing calves. So I was exposed to all this from a very, very early age, the gyms and these characters, some really strong characters, bodybuilders in those days when in my dad's gym, he had a lot of tough guys there, you know, guys from the southern suburbs of South, street fighters, um, wrestlers, you name it. But a wonder, wonderful com camaraderie, unbelievable camaraderie with all these guys. And he had like top businessmen, like the guys who owned the OK Bazaars chain were there. And then he'd have guys who were bus conductors in those days who would have bus. But they'd all end up having breakfast at a delicatessen run by a Polish guy called Plot Plotis. They'd have Plotis. And they all go for breakfast together. So it was fantastic camaraderie. And in those days, my dad bought out the, what we call track suits or sweat suits. And they all had their Reg Park health studios bags, which became very trendy and in vogue. They were either chocolate brown or a navy blue. And he bought out navy blue sweatsuits, they all with a zipper. And they'd all wear the navy blue sweatsuits. Then he bought out white, and there was a time they'd all wear the white ones, then like a honey color. So this was a, just a great club, so to speak, of these guys. Many Mr. South Africans came from there. Um, but he also had to set a precedent because he had some of these tough guys, some of them tried to challenge him, you know. So he had to, from day one, and he wasn't a guy. Uh, I mean, if you knew Reg Park in his days, he was known as a straight shooter. If he, and he, there was no, he had a great BS meter, you know, he didn't put up with any BS. And he knew, but people respected him because if he liked you, he would do anything for you and take the shirt off his back for you. And it was a genuine love. If you crossed him, that's the last time you'd ever cross him again. Um, and I remember there's a friend of his, there was a friend of his who spoke at his service who I'm still friendly with, who I looked up to when I was a kid by the name of Basil Hauser, who was a, a great soccer player. And uh, he came from a, a family of three boys it all ended up to be great soccer players basil and i became great friends and he told me a story that your dad had to set the pattern in the gym and show who the boss was because he would get a lot of these tough guys from the south who were street fighters and well known but at that time dougie baggett worked for my dad and he was renowned in south africa as a tough guy um and um when my dad had his gyms, he opened up um, a self-defense judo martial arts studio in his gym where Dougie was the teacher. It was on the fifth floor. And we all used to go there, all my mates. I'm talking eight, nine, ten years of age. We all went and became very popular. Like at the end of the, the judo class, it was a time he would go down on his hands, on his knees and like this and the whole thing the whole class would just jump on top of it, you know, and just like try and take him down. But he was a renowned tough guy. And one day they were in the gym early morning and they were kind of messing around. And uh, it was playful. Of course, there was no animosity. And he went for my dad. And my dad grabbed him and he tried to do a hip throw on my dad. And my dad reversed it. And he ended up on the floor. And he fell on the floor and cracked his jaw. And there was this loud snap throughout. And the whole gym just went silent. And Dougie said, and, and Basil said to me, we all thought that Dougie had broken his jaw. And he stood up. And he said they all were like white. 
and Nagi Maggot said, I've never in all my years, and bearing in mind he was strong, he's had a great physique, has anybody ever done that to me? Has ever, anybody ever in any match or training managed to reverse that and put me on the floor? But, you know, my dad was so powerful in those days. So he had to set the trend of who's the boss here, you know. But uh, why I say I have a regret, um, when I started getting interested in bodybuilding, um, my dad said to me, finish your swimming career. There's plenty of time for bodybuilding. You haven't reached your peak yet. You're young. I went to the Olympics, I was 19. I came like 18th. Um, and I really wanted to get into bodybuilding, but I gave it a go for another um, two years. But my interest was only in bodybuilding. He said, there's plenty of time. Fulfill your swimming career. He said, that was Olympics. You're getting your feet wet. You're a kid. You're a baby. Four years' time be a different story. And funnily enough, when I go back, I saw guys who were at the Olympics with me, you know, went for the experience. But four years later, they were meddling. And another four years later, they were doing any better. So when I think about it, 19, if I would have carried on till 27, and even today, guys in their 30s, Phelps making a comeback in his 30s, you know, um, I could have done it. Having a dad like that is, uh, yeah, you, you, you probably don't even realize like some of the things that, that he taught you, you know, and um, the influence that he had on you. And, and even like maybe what's in your DNA um, that, yeah. that was passed on. And uh, I mean, I've yeah watched a lot of your, your interviews and like your social media and stuff. And the admiration that you have for your dad is, it's amazing, you know, like, and, and like you said, like, if you sort of set out to be like him, that says a lot about the influence and how he was as a father. So, yeah, great man, that's for well, sure. Well, you know, what else was, um, I mentioned my passion for, you live in Brazil, let's call it football, because that's really the football we know, you know. So the experiences I had, I'm 12 years of age, and uh, in those days, soccer cards were very, very big, and we'd have our annuals with soccer cards, and there were certain ones that were very, very difficult to get. So it was a Sunday, and my dad says, come. I said, where are we going? He says, just bring your soccer card book with you. So I said, okay. I said, where are we going? So we're going to the gym. So my mom was driving. My dad didn't drive in the early days. <laughs> So we go to his branch from Tingen. We walk in. So imagine 12 year old kid opens the door. Who's there? The whole Highlands Park soccer team. With the coach, who's, and your mom would remember well, whose daughter Jan Forbes used to swim with us. Very good swimmer, great swimmer. And the coach was a Scottish guy, Alex Forbes, who played for Scotland and Arsenal. He was a coach. He had bought them for my dad to put them through a session. And I got the whole team's autographs. All these guys I looked up to as a kid, you know, it was like unbelievable. So same year, we go to the UK, uh, Europe. My dad did a tour of Europe. He was doing exhibitions. And my sister was, um, is, who's three years older than me. So she was 15, I was 12. And we were in the UK and my dad was doing exhibitions in all the cities, even Ireland. Uh, we went to most of them. So we go to Manchester. And of course, every one of them, yeah, I'm 12. I'm a lot more influenced by it. I understand it more. And every place he did an exhibition, this was 69. His last Mr. Universe was 1965. And um, every time he posed, the audience went crazy. And I just... <laughs> So, whoa, look at this for my dad, you know. So we go to Manchester and he had a friend there who he used to train with the name of Derek Clements. And Derek Clements was in the car business. And he said that Manchester United every year would get their cars for the whole team from his dealership. So he says, 
would you like to go and watch them train? It was the summer time. So we go and watch them train. Matt Busby meets us in. First player we meet was a guy by the name of Nobby Styles, who was a member of the 1966 England World Cup winning team. He was rehabbing, recovering from an injury and uh, he played for Manchester United and I met him and very friendly, got his autograph. We watched them train. And afterwards, Brasby took us through the whole cliff training facility. And the first place we go into is the dressing room. And who's there? Two very well-known Scottish players, one in particular by the name of Dennis Law, who was called the Duke, who was one of the top goal scorers in, um, in England. And uh, they called him the Lawman. And uh, Busby introduced us, and Dennis Law turns around and he says, um, he says, when I was uh, a young kid in Aberdeen at school, he says, you came to do an exhibition there, and our PE P. E. master was a big fan of yours, and um, he made us all come and watch you. He says, and years later, you and I were guests on a TV show. And I'm here, yeah, this, you know, football mad kid. And I'm like, just like gobsmacked. So I got their autographs. And while we're walking away, I said to my dad, Dennis Law knows who you are. And he, and he just gave this deep laugh. Then we go into the canteen where we met my mom and my grandmother and my sister. My sister's 15. And he takes us around the whole table to meet every single player. I got their whole autograph, which I still have this this day, the, the Manchester United team. And we get to, I'm just looking for something. We get to um, George Best and my sister couldn't care less about anybody else, but George Best was an absolute icon. And uh, all the girls loved him. So as long as she got George Best's autograph, that's all she cared about. <laughs> and he actually stood up and he greeted us. And uh, yeah, today, to this day, I've still got Manchester United from when I was 12 years old, including the likes of Bobby Charlton and Georgie Best and Dennis Law. And there's an iconic statue outside Old Trafford, the Holy Trinity, with George Best, Bobby Charlton, and Dennis Law. I met them all. And they had all won the, the European Footballer of the Year at different times, all playing in the same team. So that was a magical experience which has lived with me forever. And then we go to my dad's hometown, Leeds. And we went to watch Leeds train. And my dad actually at age 16, played for Leeds United in the reserve team. And he played for Yorkshire, the, 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 the uh, county school team. He was the captain of Yorkshire schoolboys. Now, like me, he was, uh, you know, he changed direction. He was a great footballer and he wanted to turn pro. He injured his knee and that's how he got bitten by the bug. He started doing remedial strength work. That's how he got into the bodybuilding. Now, they were arguably the two best teams in England at the time because Manchester had just won the European Cup. Leeds United just won the league. They also had an iconic team. But playing for Leeds United was Bobby Charlton's brother, Jackie, who owned a sh sports shop in Leeds, which I visited. And uh, they both were part of the 1966 England World Cup winning team. So they're doing their run around cool down after the training. And Jackie Charlton says, hello, Reg. And again, I'm like blown away. And I said, jeez, Jackie Charlton knows who you are. So after the game, after the practice, he comes out and my dad says, hey, Jackie, can you do me a favor? He says, sure. He says, can you get my son, John John, the autographs? He says, I'll do better than that. He says, come on, son. And he took me in the dressing room. I got the whole team's autographs. One of them was a South African guy by the name of Albert Johansson. And uh, he was the first, one of the first players to end up going to South Africa. So fast forward now, 19, early 70s. You know, I'm um, 
in my teens, late teens. Bobby Charlton, Jackie Charlton, and the late England captain, also one of the greatest players of all time, Bobby Moore, came to South Africa to do, they had finished playing, but they came to do um, appearances. They were staying at the Landros Hotel. So my dad goes and he has tea with Jackie Charlton and he invites Bobby and Jackie for dinner. He says, go and pick them up. I go and pick them up. They come to our house for dinner. I took them in my bedroom. It wasn't done because they were great rivals, but because of the history, I had Leeds United on one wall, Manchester United on the other. I took them into my room. They signed everything and I took them home again. And I'm thinking, you know, that was the benefit of being Reg Park's son. Years later, the year my dad died, we had a, a uh, Arnold and Maria, who he was married to at the time. Uh, he called me in South Africa, wanting to speak to my mom. She was too distraught, 2007. I said, I'm going to have a service for my dad when I come back. He says, Maria and I would like to host it. And we did, he did. It's true to his word. And, you know, bearing in mind, my dad never lived in America. There were probably 500 people there from all over. And Arnold spoke with absolutely no ego. And he, and he was very humorous. Before him, Franco Colombo spoke, who was his best friend and training partner, who was a Mr. Universe, Mr. America. He was also one of the visitors that my dad had. And of course, Arnold, my dad brought Arnold to South Africa, you know, in 1967 as a young kid. And he told him if he gets his calves up, he'd be the greatest bodybuilder in the world, you know. Because he said to my dad, he met him at an exhibition in London, when will you bring me to South Africa? It's as if you win the universe. And the relationship has been since 67, him and my dad, and now my sister and he, uh, and my sister and I and he. And um, going back to that, um, 2007, after my dad died, Arnold hosted it and he said, if it wasn't for Reg Park, I wouldn't be here today, you know. And um, after that, I went to a very great friend of mine who became a great friend of my dad's, a South African man who was very well known, very successful in South Africa by the name of Manfred Manny Sinkovitz. We're still friends to this day. And he was at the memorial. And he is a big Arsenal fan. And we'd watch a lot of football together. And every time my dad was here, him and Manny would get together. It's become a great family friend. He's kind of filled a void for me in my life. And um, he said to me, when I went to see him the first time after this memorial, he said to me, John, John, he said, it was unbelievable. He says, Arnold spoke great. He says, you and you spoke great. Your daughter, she was only 12 at the time. He says, it was great. Trent was great. My daughter, Savannah, just, Travis was away already in South Africa, traveling. And uh, he was traveling around the world. He just finished high school but he wrote something really nice. He says, if you were going to watch Man United play, he says, who would you like them to, who would you want to watch play? I said, in those days, we're talking 2007, I said, it has to be Arsenal, Manny. They're the two most entertaining teams in England. And they were neck and neck all the time. There was Arsene Wenger from, from Arsenal, and Ferguson from Man U. He says, and who would you like to take? I said, since she's never had the experience, I'd like to take Michelle. He says, okay. Just want to tell you, I've had this for a while, waiting for the opportune time. He says, I've got you two round trip tickets. He says, to London, to Manchester. He says, hotel accommodation paid for, sitting in the ambassador's box, a tour of the stadium. Oh my God, you know. So he said, I was at an auction, he's very into art. And it was at the Arm and Hammer Museum, who the Glazers, who, own majority shares of Man United were, were, were um, donors to. says, and one of the items uh, on auction was these two tickets. He said, I turned around to Jennifer, who was his wife at the time. He said, screw this. He says, I'm getting this for John John. Wow. And he waited for everybody to bid and he outbid them all. 
I was at the gym. I opened that gym that you came to in 2006. It was very challenging. I'd split up from my partner. So I actually postponed it going for two years. So they honored it, but I put it off to 2009. So I went and we had this magical time. Um, we sat in the ambassador's box and it was at the time that Manchester City had just got all the money behind them. And Alex Ferguson soon called them the noisy neighbors. And we're sitting in this ambassador's box and I'm pointing out to Michelle all these iconic figures like former England captain, Man United captain, um, Brian Robson and saw Bobby Charlton. And in the ambassador, in the, before we had a lunch, we had our own special table and the ambassador for the day was goalkeeper by the name of Alex Stephanie, who um, was part of the 69 European Cup winning team. So it was magical. And um, the game was 3-3. And of course, I'm going along with all the songs. And, um, sorry, I, I regress. Going back, the day before the game, we had a private tour. And the guy in charge was um, um, a former Man United fan since he was a little boy. And he walked us onto the pitch down the tunnel and they played the music and I touched the ground and I was freaking out and I was very emotional because I thought back to my dad, you know, and he took us to have pictures with the trophies and he introduces us to this other guy who's, an, you know, one of the um, uh, officials there and he said, this man, he says, he's born in South Africa, but he lives in Los Angeles, and he knows more about Manchester United than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we went to the game, and it was 3 3. And um, Manchester United bought on within the last 15 minutes, a guy by the name of Michael Owen, who was a great player, played for Liverpool in England, Real Madrid, but they finally bought him. And he came on and he scored. So, man, you won 4 3. And I could not believe it. It was like unbelievable. And uh, it went down. And a lot of my friends are contacting me and say, I can't believe you at that game. I've got a very you know, good friend in London. You went to that game. It went down. Wayne Rooney said it was the best game he ever played in. And it went down. They did a booklet on the first 20 years of the premiership, the top 20 of everything, players, games, this was ranked number four. The next day, I go because the museum was closed during game day. So Michelle went shopping. It was our last day. I wanted to go for a tour of, this, of, of the museum. I walk in, and the same guy who took us around, I saw him. He said, go and enjoy yourself. I just walked in. He says to me, he taps me on the shoulder. He says to me, excuse me. But are you Reg Park's son? I said, as a matter of fact, I am. He says, can you come with me, please? I said, sure. I go to the front. There's a woman working there. She says, are you Reg Park's son? I said, I am. I said, how would you know? She says, first of all, you look like him. And secondly, your name. I said, but still, how would you know? So she asked me, do you know, do you remember Walter O'Malley? I said, of course. He was a great British bodybuilder. I said, I saw him in 69 competing. Says, that's my father. No way. I said, I said, I don't believe it. So I give her like a little leaflet with my email and everything of all the Reg Park products I was selling, which was a biography of his life, a DVD and T-shirts, etc. So I felt like he was watching over me. So fast forward, I come back to the States. Michelle took all these pictures and I said, where are the pictures? Where are the pictures? It was a public holiday. I said, she says, I don't know. I'll, don't worry about it. There's a knock on the door. There's a package delivered. And she had this beautiful album made for me, all the pictures, you know. So I get an email from this woman and Walter O'Malley's daughter. She said, it's my dad's birthday coming up. He's 70. Can I get some T-shirts? I said, absolutely. She says, I'll pay whatever. 
and I sent him t-shirts of my dad, Reg Park the Legend t-shirts and the video, the DVD. And she wrote to me, she said he opened them up and he was in absolute tears. So that encapsulates, you know, what it was like having Reg Park as a dad. And I've had so many people after he passed who've came to me and said they wish they'd had the relationship with their father like I did. But, you know, my buddies, so especially when my later teens and we were older, they used to love coming and hanging out and talking to him because my dad knew the scene. He was one of the boys. He was like really cool. You know, he knew exactly what was going on, you know. And um, I had a guy come to me in my gym, sitting in my office, which you came to, and he's was a very good martial artist. He was a sensei. And I hadn't seen him for years. And he worked up the street. He said, I just wanted to come and tell you. And he sat on my couch, East Coast Italian guy, tough guy, started to cry. He says, if I had one minute of, my, of a relationship with my dad that you had, I'd be a very, very happy man. So I didn't realize it. I took it for granted, but I was blessed, you know. But you're gonna make me tear up here, like just thinking about <laughs> thinking about yeah. what a yeah. an amazing influence he had, you know. And I guess yeah. the name Legacy just makes so much sense, doesn't it? You know, like he's still living through you, but also just living through lots of other people. And um, you know, like when you're talking now and you're like you're saying like people come up to you with these stories, it's almost like you hear people that have stories about guys like say like Nelson Mandela you know and they're like you know they're like oh yeah I remember him and he did this <coughs> and it's it's kind of almost like that sort of stature you know what I mean and um yeah the world is so much better for men like that that have just really left a good mark um and yeah. uh left like a good impression and good lessons for for what it is to kind of really be a human um yeah I couldn't really think of any other way to finish a podcast and we we've, you know, we're probably both going to choke up in a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, we, there's literally, I mean, you're a fantastic storyteller. Like I, I, I feel like we could, you know, sit here for days and uh, listen to the stories that you have, you know, because you've lived this very colorful life with such great influences and actually just your expertise, like you could sit down and speak to you for hours, you know, like you were my, my first bodybuilding coach and you gave me this, I remember you giving me this program and I was like, this is crazy. Like I'm, I'm not really like hitting the weights that much, you know, like, and I'm stretching a lot. And I was like, well, flipping, he's, he knows what he's doing. And it was like one of the most awesome programs I've ever had. That, that, like people don't realize how much they have to learn from a guy like yourself, right? You have literally mm -hmm. trained the elite of the elite. And um, mm -hmm. like you said earlier on, you're not the type of guy who necessarily learns by say reading something. It's once you get hands-on and you start doing something that you really learn. And I mean, I've experienced that firsthand through you. So I'm, I can totally say that John, John is the man when it comes to, to training and, and the body Thank and you. everything like that. But mm -hmm. We will definitely have that follow-up podcast, but I just wanted to say, like, it really has been so great just listening to the stories, you know, like at the end of the day, John, John, this is what life is about, isn't it? Life is right. about stories right. and life is about storytelling, right. you know what I mean? So yeah. I just want to say thanks so much for, for sharing it's, that. It's, it's, it's my pleasure. And I, um, you know, I'm on a parallel with you because unfortunately, uh, especially what's going on in the world today, Gareth, we've not us particular, but we've the world in general has lost sight of humanity and just goodness and kindness. And to me, that's what it's all about. And the most important thing for me in life, more than anything else, which I was instilled by, uh, was instilled by both my mom and dad. And, and by the way, my mom really wasn't, can share a story with you at another time about that. But my mom was the, the the rock. She was the quiet strength behind my dad in many, many ways. But, um, you know, they taught me about relationships. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, 
people come and go, money comes and goes. But the most important thing is your relationships, which is why for me, um, a lot of people said, geez, how come you've got so many friends all over the world and you're still friendly with this one and that one from primary school? And I said, because I work at it. Because that's all you have mm -hmm. at the end of the day is relationships and the people you surround yourself with. That's what makes you a success. Like Arnold says, I'm not a self-made man. I'm driven. That's self-made. But I don't take all the attributes for being self-made. Yeah, I'm a driven person, but if it wasn't for these people in my life, of course, which he mentions very poignantly, my dad and my mom, actually, in the first episode of the um, Arnold docuseries, um, you know, he's right. I mean, no one gave him that drive but himself, but none of us are self-made. And, you know, what makes us who we are and whether we're successful and happy is the people we surround ourselves with. And that's to me is the, is, is the most important thing in life. And I, I couldn't agree more, you know, and, and it's like, yeah. you know, you, I, I listen to you talk and you're like, and this guy, and you remember the guy's like name and surname and then this guy, and then I knew him and you're like, I knew him from primary school and then I knew him from swimming and I knew, and that is a rich life. You know, that's a, that's a full life when you can speak so almost passionately about these mates that you have and then you're like yeah i'm still friends with him or friends with her and you recall these cool memories and you know that's that's what you die with but you die with memories yeah. and experiences yeah. you, your yeah. your formula one lamborghini huge six um story house like that stuff means zero when you're gone you know so it's the experiences yeah. and the people and like i said through your storytelling I hope uh, people listen to the sort of subliminal uh, messages that are there, you know, for us to kind of learn on what it is to live a meaningful and, and great life. So thanks so much, bud. And I, I really look forward to, to round two. Well, Absolutely. Gareth, thank you. I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you again. Thank and, you. And, and uh, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, hope to see you soon and I hope to see you in person one day. Thanks, Enjoy bud. the life. Thanks, Thanks bud. You. you too, bud.